Are you tweeting again? It's what I do. I know. It is what you do. I, I, I'm a Twitter girl. It's a problem. <laughs> I love Google+, uh, Plus, but Twitter... Star Strider is... on Twitter with a Y. With a Y. I and should I'm put FG up my lower third. On Twitter. Yes, you are. Um, you should put up your lower third. Yeah, who are you? Again, who is this person? It's all a mystery. A <sighs> mystery, I tell you. So the, I guess, the third and final act of our trilogy, <laughs> Weekly Space Hangout, Astronomy Cast, Astronomy Cast, ends in fiery death with the Chelyabinsk meteor. Actually, no fiery death, because nobody died. Um, ends in exploding fireworks with the Chelyabinsk. Fiery Shattered roof glass. collapse. Shattered glass, I guess, is how it ends. There was um, a roof collapse. Was there, was there a roof mm -hmm. collapse? Mm -hmm. mm. Not exactly fiery, more like... <laughs> but... Um, yeah, so uh, once again... Oh, did I remember to click on the Q&A app? No. Do we need to restart? I Can did turn on turn... the Q&A app. Okay. Whoa, and people are already using it, so, you know, it's all working. Um, okay. And people have been asking their questions again. That's great. Thank you very much, everybody. Um... Someone could have any astronomer from history in the virtual star party. Who would you choose? I would choose Galileo. Can you imagine showing Galileo <laughs> stuff in the virtual star party? Like showing it, would, it would turn into a total Bill and Ted's excellent oh, adventure. That would be so great. Um, great question, though. Wow. Um, we'll, ask, we'll, we'll answer that one again at the end of the show. Okay, so for those of you who just joined us, who maybe missed the first part of this, we are going to be recording a live episode of Astronomy Cast. This is going to be episode 334, Chelyabinsk, one year later. So we are recording this on February 7th, but this is the show that we would normally record on February 10th, Monday, and it would go live on our feed on February 17th. Monday, which is the closest we get to Chelyabinsk. So this is how we have to think into the future. We have to plan these things out like a like a careful orchestra of celestial objects. So can you tell I've had four cups of coffee and uh, three uh, three shows? That's all right. Punchy. I apparently had like the best typo ever. Did you? Uh, Fergus Mason on Twitter points out that instead of writing Chelyabinsk, I wrote Chelyabink, which Chelyabink. just leads to the idea of a meteor hitting and going bink. Um, Thomas, I have updated my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he was trying to get at. I didn't know what he was talking about. He's like, Fraser, it's, it's February now. I'm like, what have I done? I have not updated my calendar. Look, and look what's going on here in my year in space calendar. We've got Sarah Horst. Oh, awesome. Isn't that great? And we've Sarah's got... Sarah's a great human. I know, and so this is great. The world of Titan. So, year in space, 2014 calendar <laughs> for February. I am slow on the uptake today. So... It's okay. Um, Q&A app is on, so if you want to ask any questions, you can use the Q&A app. We will stick around at the end and, and answer some questions. I don't know how, long, how your time is. Um, I'm doing okay. Okay. Uh, at some point I'll have to be a parent, but, you know, whatever. Lord of the Flies. <laughs> uh, um, okay. I think I'm ready. You ready there? I, I know your children. It's more like Jungle Book. Yeah. So say yeah, when. I'm good. I'm pressing record. I am also pressing record. Hi, Preston. <laughs> Hello, Preston. Once again, we thank you for your dedication to Astronomy Cast. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 334, Chelyabinsk, one year later. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos. We help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? G get, a little, uh, get a little crazy, actually. Now that You are over-caffeinated. I am over-caffeinated, it's true. I'm yeah. recovering from the flu, so we're a great pair today. Right. We're, uh, although it sounds like it's been week after week that you've been getting your astronomy cast just like normal, we're actually recording two of them today, just after we recorded the Weekly Space Hangout. So, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, 
It's a very high energy. <laughs> I'm pretty jazzed up. Um, so, uh, is there any other announcements? Anything interesting to talk about? Uh, just a reminder, we have all the apps. There's a 365 yeah. Days of Astronomy app. There's an Astronomy Cast app. There's a Universe Today Phases of the Moon app. There are two, count them two, but only available on Android, uh, CosmoQuest apps. So if you want to support the shows and get something that you can go look and, and learn and have fun, uh, go get apps, please. Perfect. Please. Go, go all the apps. Download all, all the, the apps. apps. Um, cool. And then I just want to remind people that we're uh, making our videos on Universe Today, uh, and they're available now on iTunes. So if you want to download the videos and have them show up on your mobile device at the time of your choosing and watch them, uh, you can go to universetoday.com slash video or universetoday.com slash audio, and you can subscribe or you can get them on iTunes as well. Uh, cool. Well, let's get rocking. So around this time last year, a space rock crashed into the Earth above Chelyabinsk, Russia. It brightened the skies for hundreds of kilometers, broke windows, and injured many people. Let's look back at the event. What happened, and what did we learn? Can can you believe it's been a year? I know it. It it's it was one of those events where I was not quite at the dead asleep stage, but at the I'm asleep and the bed is so warm stage and and my phone started going off and and I pick it up and and Nicole noisy astronomer uh, Nicole Gugalucci was uh, basically like something happened in Russia get on the internet right now and that caused me to actually get out of my nice warm bed and go to my keyboard in the middle of the night and um, it was unclear exactly what had happened other than it was a very bright object that could not be denied and YouTube videos were going mm -hmm. up left and right and I think the first thing that we learned is Russia has so many terrible drivers that everybody has dashboard cams. Right, but you and so shortly after Nicole told you I you, called you. You called me, and I think Phil called me as well. Like there was like all of these phone calls going back and forth as we were notifying each other. Jason Major, let me know as well. So, <laughs> so it was the same thing. You know, I had, I know you live two hours into the future, and I had sort of was just about ready to go to bed as well. And yeah, and then my phone was going off, and so we all so watched much it for on... sleep. Time, yeah. time to go to work. And so we had to, you know, sit down in front of the computer and get reporting and get updating and figure out what was going on. Well, and the first question all of us had was this was the same day that an asteroid was scheduled to make a very close approach, passing much closer than the moon, in fact, passing closer than geosynchronous satellites to the planet Earth. And so there was the, wait, was there another object that's related? And, and so, of course, that, that was the first thing, and everyone's trying to figure out from the dashboard cams and where the sun is and all of that what, what the directionality of the impact was, and people fairly quickly realized, no, completely unrelated object, completely different orbit, coming from a completely different direction, we're good. Um, but so that, that was the, the neat thing was how quickly we were able to start estimating what direction in the sky it came from by looking at, it was early in the morning, could see the sun, had geographic landmarks, dashboard cams, street signs, street light cameras, and could watch the bink, 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 bink as it goes right. all across the city. The tell you bink. Um, so can you then paint a picture, like if you were living in Russia, which you have done, uh, and you were driving to work in the morning. I wouldn't did they, have done that. What did they see? Uh, so, so these poor sides who are up early in the morning fighting with traffic uh, were minding their own business when all of a sudden something brighter than the sun was went streaking across the sky and then went kablooey and caused a giant flash. And this was in a good sized city but kind of in the middle of nowhere Russia. So out near the Ural Mountains. Um, this is a factory city, and that's got to be somewhat freaky when you live in a country that, like the U.S., grew up under the fear of the Cold War. So you have all of these people suddenly seeing bright thing across sky, kablooey. 
And the problem was that as it went through the sky, it was initially going faster than the speed of sound. So there was the shock wave of the explosion and the sonic boom that traveled much slower than the speed of light. So you see move, 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 kablooey flash, and then pause, and then you get hit with the shock wave of the sonic boom. Now, for the drivers, they got to see the entire process or catch it out of a mirror or something like that. But to the poor souls who were still eating their breakfast or in a classroom or something else, nature had it out for them because this is a Russian city. They didn't exactly use shatterproof glass to build your average apartment window. So people see giant flash, that's the type of thing that causes you to get up from the table and walk to the window and go, huh? And about the time they're getting to the window, the shockwave hits and it pretty much shattered $33 million worth of glass in the city of Chelyabinsk. Can you imagine, like, like, you, it's exactly right that, that you'd be like in bed, you'd be, you know, you'd be at the kitchen table, whatever, and then suddenly your entire room would be lit up as if it was daylight. And so first thing, you're like, that's it, that's the bomb, it's the end of the world, here comes Armageddon. But yes. you would probably walk over to the window to sort of figure out what it was that had gone on. You'd look up, and you'd see this big plume in the sky. And then, and you're like, huh, what is going on? And then and, seconds and later... One of the awesome things is, is I speak very bad Russian, but it was enough that I could understand a fair amount of what was going on in the YouTube videos. And, and so you have these drivers, they're like, huh, that's odd, or that's weird. And, and they'd say it in a completely matter-of-effect voice. Very, well, it's another day, there's another a flash day. in the sky, gonna keep going, no big deal. No one's pulling over, no panic. Yeah. People with cell phone cameras, you see them like, ooh, must get a better shot, but that's the Instagram mentality, not the the world is ending mentality. Um, yeah. and, and so I just love that characteristic that is so different from what you'd get in the United States. Right, and so you just imagine those poor people, they're walking over, they're staring up at this big cloud in the sky, and they're trying to figure this out, and it's, it's silent. And, just completely and, silent, right? And, and after then... the kablooey, there's just this beautiful contrail through the sky that's starting to get all squiggly as, as the wind moves it around. And then? Yeah, and then, boom, this shockwave roars through and just explodes the window in everyone's faces. And, and was it 1,500 <laughs> people went was... to the hospital? With glass, in, like glass injury, so severe it's, that they had to go to the hospital, right? Like you can imagine, again, these are tough Russians who just took a, a wearing plate winter glass window clothing. in the face. Yeah. And and in it, the winter it's, time, yeah. In, it's in one Russia. of those things that nature had it out for them. It was the perfect. It was the perfect setup for a really painful joke. It, it yeah. was a Three Stooges episode, and we were one of the Stooges. And, but amazingly, like nobody died. No one died. died. Nobody yeah. died. The, a Tunguska-level event happened over Russia, and nobody died, which, and, is just, and which is just amazing. To put some perspective on the initial impactor, the thing that initially entered our atmosphere, it burned up, got smaller as it went through the atmosphere. The object, when it started to enter the atmosphere, is estimated to have been about the same mass as the Eiffel Tower. The chunk that they eventually were able to pull out as the largest piece, which landed in a lake, was still over a thousand pounds. Really? I didn't know they, they, they pulled up a, a chunk that big. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, they set it on the scales to weigh it, and it tipped over the scales. Literally, it tipped the scales, and when it hit, this thing that had survived through the atmosphere broke into three pieces. Wow. Yeah. So we've got this, you know, on the morning of February, it was 15th. 15th. Right? Yeah, February 15th, this, this object came from space, detonated in the upper atmosphere. How high up? Did it explode? Sorry, Preston, you're going to have to edit the pause while I look this up. 
You asked me a number that I had it in front of me and then I looked away. Okay, sorry. Uh, answering the question, you can now go back. Sorry, Preston. Uh, so we think that it probably uh, exploded in the air at an altitude of about 97,000 feet or 18.4 miles or 30 kilometers. So this was about three times higher than your average commercial airliner flies at on the, the long haul flights. So it was high up in the atmosphere when it exploded. And that actually had one very neat consequence of it scattered shards over a huge area of land and it was Russia in winter in the Ural Mountains. So this is, is a snowy place and so there's lots of really neat stories of um, school children basically going out and looking at the surface of the snow for holes in the snow and then digging down where the hole in the snow was to find the meteor shards. And, and as someone who grew up on the East Coast, that's, that's how you can find clams as you look for the the air hole in the water and then you dig down and there's a clam. Well, they, they used essentially the look for the hole in the snow and if this had happened in summer well first of all there would have been a lot more injuries because people wouldn't have been dressed as solidly and I'm sure people with the flying glass got in many cases protected by their heavy winter clothing um, but you wouldn't have been able to find nearly as many chunks of it because it would have just been harder if it hit dry land rather than penetrating through nice white snow yeah you think about that right now like there are probably meteorites all around you wherever you are you just can't recognize them because exactly. they just look like rocks. And and some meteorites, I, we, we don't think about this, but one of the really great posters I saw one year was from collecting meteorite fragments and then they were comparing them to the size of rabbit herds and photographs. And so the meteorites were smaller than, than the little rabbit balls of poo. And that was the most fascinating thing to see on the science poster. Right. So there's so, small pieces of, of the universe all around you, and they're very hard to find. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we've got this object, mass of the Eiffel Tower. How, how big was it then? It, it was several kilometers across initially. Do you want to, um, try, do you want to answer that one again? Because I don't think I it was several that. kilometers no, across. No, you're right. It was several meters across. Yeah. Hold on. I, I was looking at how fast it it's was It's the moving. size of Texas. Yeah, I totally, 20 meters. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, Preston, this is going to be the episode where I get numbers wrong. Um, it, it, we think that it was probably about 20 meters across initially, and of course it got smaller as it came down. Um, it burnt up, so in some cases you have, as it passes through the atmosphere, the heat is literally melting the outer parts of it. Um, it eventually exploded into small fragments, um, and those pieces went all over the place. Um, in one case, uh, it destroyed the roof of a uh, factory building, so roughly a 600 square meter roof went flat, no more roof. And uh, this this happened in winter, and one of the biggest issues they had to deal with, this is all a lesson in, in all the things that can go wrong. Um, this is a city that has central heating for the entire city, so they're, they're pumping hot steam, hot water to all the buildings. And with all these windows blown out, you've had with the freezing weather problems with pipes freezing, we've had problems with, with pipes freezing here. Well, now you're looking at an entire city that shares the same heating system. Thousands of windows blown out. And so the city got behind replacing all of the windows that went into people's apartments. They didn't replace like balcony windows that might have gotten arms. broken. Yeah. But um, so it was a level of, of damage that we hadn't encountered, but it could have been so much worse. Right, and so this is where I was going to go next, which was that you looked at Tunguska, and it was about the same sized object, wasn't it? Maybe Tunguska was, was a little bigger? But it was a completely different type of event. There's, there's a lot of people that think that Tunguska was probably a comet or at least a more volatile, rich object that came down, because when it exploded, it leveled a massive area of Siberian forest. It, it's clear that the universe has it out in particular for, for Russia. For Russia. Um, 
so so when the Tunguska event occurred, uh, there was this massive shock wave that flattened forests, and we didn't see that kind of a shock wave with with the Chelyabinsk event. Now the thing with the Chelyabinsk is it was basically a lumpy rock. This was a kind of rare kind of lumpy rock called an LL chondroit. Uh, this means that it was low on metals, uh, it was low on iron, and this combination means that you're basically looking at the type of material that the crust of the earth is made of. It, it had a lot of silicas, what metal it did have in it was ferrous oxides. Um, everything's formed together into, well this is where the name comes from, chondrules of material that, that the minerals are bound together. But it's not a metallic object, it's a mineral of stuff that's all mixed together. And this lumpy chondrules of mineral in this big old rock is perfectly happy to fall apart which gives us all of these different shards of meteorite. Had this been an iron rich asteroid that wouldn't have fallen apart in the atmosphere quite the same way. Had this been a comet or something else that was extremely volatile rich the process of having all those gases sublimate would have caused a different kind of shock. So since it was a nice, friendly, low metal, low iron chondroit rock, this was about as low a harm event as we really could have asked for given its size. It also didn't come straight down. Uh, right, that was my next question I was going to ask is like what was the impact angle? How did it, how did it come in? Well, so it swept across uh, Russia, nice, long, slow ad, um, angle of impact. So if, if you look at one of the images of it, um, it, it spent a long time in the upper atmosphere. The long time that it spent in the upper atmosphere meant that it got slowed down a lot by the atmosphere. Uh, it's when stuff comes straight down and you don't have these nice gentle impact angles that you end up with the the energy not getting given off into the atmosphere but instead it's able to plow much more deeply into the earth. And yeah, there's a, some wonderful bad. simulations that I've seen of the Tunguska impact and it, it, it's like this plume of energy that just came straight down like a hammer and and that's what flattened all the forests out from this from this impact zone. While with the Chelyabinsk, right. it was this it was this low skimming impact, which which I think was again was was we were we were really protected by the the composition of the object and the and the impact angle. It it still all of this said gave off twenty to thirty times the amount of energy of the nuclear bomb that was given that exploded in Hiroshima. So it was a lot of energy, but it was a lot of energy given off in a long distance through our atmosphere rather than all in the impact. Um, the explosion occurred up above airplane flying altitudes and then it was just the chunks. And one of the really neat things that I read was the majority of the, the pieces were gravelly sized and as they came down they hit their terminal velocity. So since they were traveling at their personal terminal velocity it was the same as dropping a piece of gravel off of a skyscraper. Sure it's going fast but it's not going as fast as that thousand pound block that luckily fell into a lake, that was going at about 60 to 70 percent the speed of sound. Right. So, right. The rest yeah. of that raining rock down on everybody was not quite as, as damaging. Right. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So was it like shedding material as it was, you know, like it detonated and was one big chunk that just kept going or was that chunk ablating as it went through the atmosphere? It, it's one of those things that we're probably going to be telling that story for a long time. People are going to have to go out, map out the full distribution of where all the meteor chunks were. There were a couple of unconfirmed, unfollowed up on 
uh, reports of chunks that fell much further east of the main event where if they're to be believed, and I don't think they are since no one followed up on them and it's been a year, um, but if they were to be believed there might have been some chunks that were given off in earlier eruptions um, than the final explosion essentially uh, that left behind this one giant piece. And on that day, the next day, all of humanity came together to seriously assess the asteroid threat and built a fleet no. of space missions that no. imaged all of the no. asteroids to tremendous detail and no. sent out teams of astronauts to, uh, no. to start pushing astronauts into safe orbits to protect us from this terrible future. No, in, in the years since then we have seen cuts pretty much globally for the funding for astronomy which means that coming up with ways to deter the threat, coming up with ways to discover these is going to get harder and harder. People got really busy though. People were, there was a lot of attention within like a week. Yes. And I know like our friends from the B612 Foundation and you know a lot of other people were asked to speak and provide their expert advice. Planetary resources. Planetary resources, yeah. To share what kind of a threat this is. And I know there was there was sort of conversations on on the hill. And then let's there, take an axe to all the funding. It, it's one of those things that kind of amazes me because when it comes to our fear of terrorism, um, there seems to be no amount of money that they're unwilling to spend um, in, in order to try and prevent nail clippers from going onto airplanes. Yeah. What about the war that the universe <laughs> has started on us? Who's? Why are we funding against this war against the universe? Because it started it. It's throwing rocks at us. We need to fight back. I and and this is one of those things that leaves me somewhat baffled, but it is what it is. So I, I can only ask that every time they increase the amount of imaging technology used on me and my baggage when we fly, they spend the same amount of money on imaging technology to protect us from rocks from space. So there, now there's a few things in the works though, like WISE just came back online yes. and, and it is searching, you know, it's using, uh, it's searching infrared. for infrared objects which asteroids definitely uh, are in that. Are. Um, and then there's the work on the NeoCam, right, which is going to be another potential mission. There's the Sentinel mission, which is what the B612 Foundation is, is working on. There's stuff the planetary the large resources is doing. Telescope. Right. So there are there are a bunch of missions that are in the works, but we didn't see like a rise in funding. We didn't see any extra energy put into these things. If anything, the overall budgets have been have been cut back. Right. So it's it's one of those things where I can't explain it. All I can do is sigh into my microphone. Right. We heard it. It was a sigh heard around the world. Um, so so what's next then? I mean, they're going to be studying this rock for, for years, for decades. I mean, it's great. They've got a huge chunk of space delivered. Well, and and what I also love is the entrepreneurial uh, spirit that came up. Is is almost immediately chunks of the Chelyabinsk meteor were available. I, you're looking for yours. I, I am. I am. Yeah, looking. Mine, for mine's unfortunately in in my office on campus, um, where I can share it with students and go here. It's cool. Thank you, Richard Drum. Um, there. Yes. There's a rock. This isn't Chelyabinsk, though. This is. Oh. This is. Can can I buy one? Uh, you actually have one sitting on my desk that I don't trust customs with that Richard Drum got for you. Richard so, Drum got me a chunk of the Chelyabinsk meteor and it's waiting on your desk for me. Why Why have I only just discovered this now? Because I thought I told you it. Apparently I forgot. That is so cool. Rick, Richard Drum, thank you so much. I love you. Okay. Uh, that is so great. Richard Drum is the person who got me into meteorite fandom in the first place. So the fact that he's just continuing this habit is great. He he is the the awesome individual that keeps our YouTube channel going and does all the audio editing for 365 days of astronomy. So when you donate to 365, you're helping me pay Richard to be awesome. So how much does a piece of the Telebusk meteor cost? 
I, I don't know. Ask the Internet. Okay. Internet, how much does it cost? I'll look it up on eBay. Of course you could buy them on eBay. That's amazing. Um, okay, so so people are going to be studying these for, for years, right? Yes, and, and this is one of those cases where uh, I suspect that people are just going to be going out with metal detectors. And, and that's the awesome thing is even though it was a low metallicity, low iron meteorite, um, it is still more metal rich than your average piece of, say, granite. And this means that the way they were able to find that giant chunk in the bottom of the lake is, well, initially they actually sent in February in Russia um, emergency dive teams down to look for it, and when they looked at the bottom of the lake, they found nada. But that summer, a science team went down, surveyed the bottom of the lake using metal detectors, identified a large object using the metal detectors, and it had buried itself in the mud at the bottom of the lake. Oh, yeah, and that really yeah. makes sense. If you've ever walked around in the lake, it does not have a completely solid bottom. And if something's going to hit at a fairly significant fraction of the speed of sound, it's not just going to rest tidally on the bottom. So they dug it up, brought it to the surface, tipped over the scales with it, broke it into three pieces. But the way they found it was with the metal detector. So people are going to be going out with metal detectors collecting pieces, mapping out the distribution, figuring out just how far and wide were these things scattered. So when will we see another one of these? How often, he says, while well, Pamela coughs, how often will, will an object of this sort of size and mass and, and damage hit the planet? And, and this is one of those things that we talked about some last week we can't fully answer that question because we haven't fully mapped all of this size of object. There's an entire class of asteroids, the Apollo asteroids, that have Earth-crossing orbits. And it's just a matter of time before one of these orbits causes us and one of these Apollo asteroids to be in the same place at the same time. And when that happens, things go kablooey or big, depending on what noise you choose to attribute to it. And and so we're now looking at, we've seen Chelyabinsk, we've seen Tunguska every hundred years or so. Wow. We don't know, though. We, we've previously been saying this was every few hundred years. The bigger things we're still looking at being every few million years or hundreds of millions of years, um, depending on how big you want to look. We're also overdue for one of those. Yeah, I know. 65 million years ago, the last one hit, right? And it's time. Yeah. Universe. Yeah. <gasps> All right. Well, I uh, thanks a lot, Pamela. And it was it was it was amazing to sort of experience this whole story unfold with you and and the rest of the space community. We all sort of had a chance to watch this whole thing unfold in a time of the internet, and it was it was quite an experience. And I and I hope it turns into the wake up call that we know it should be for the for the lawmakers and the fund. And the funding agencies to try and get some of these things mapped out and searched out, and that would be great. Yeah, I, I really think the idea of, I mean, it, it sounds lame, but it's a fairly reasonable argument. Let's spend the same amount of money looking for the things the universe is doing to try and kill us that we use to try and find ways to identify uh, other people who are trying to kill us. That, that would just be, I mean, imagine if we spent the same amount of money on astronomy and space science that we spend on TSA, that we spend on Border Patrol, that we spend on the FBI, on the CIA, all those organizations involved in protecting us from death. Um, let's look for death from the skies. Together we can defeat the universe. Yes, yes we can. <gasps> all right, that, that, I think that's a t-shirt. All right, <laughs> thanks Pamela. We'll see Thank you next you. week. Okay, bye-bye. And stay tuned while Don't we you pause. Go anywhere. We are simply saving, and then we will answer your questions with my froggy voice, which is so much better than it was a week ago. Yeah. A week ago, I my voice was cracking and disappearing and imploding, and I had the flu. And now, tiny intern on Twitter has the flu because I made the mistake of letting her borrow my gloves. Right. The play gloves.
seven, seven. Man, there is mayhem in this house right now. I can hear the children. <laughs> I can hear them. <laughs> can you hear them? Yeah. I wonder yes. how much that's going to make its way into the episode. <sighs> All right. <clears throat> Good. I'm safe. You? Are you safe? I, I, I am saved. Okay. You've been saved. All right. So so yeah, our intern here at SIUE is at Tiny Intern on Twitter, and that just makes me happy. Ooh, I just about filled my hard drive. I should clean that up. All right, um, but I'm sure that's very interesting to everybody watching. So let's remind you that if you want to ask Pamela some questions, either about what we talked about today or any talk about space and astronomy, like for example, what is string theory? Uh, <laughs> why is there something and not nothing? Um, what came before the Big Bang, uh, is time travel possible? Those kinds of questions, Pamela's glad to answer them. But until then, we'll get rolling. So Paul Stewart says, I get to watch Astronomy Cast while imaging the sun. My day can't get any better. Paul Stewart, if you aren't aware, is the upside-down astronomer uh, who is imaging the sun right now from New Zealand and run, don't walk, to check out his website. It is unbelievable. He does amazing. Yeah, he yeah. often joins us at the Virtual Star Party prominences on the sun and the nighttime stuff too but he's, his daytime stuff is just is unbelievable so upside down astronomer Paul Stewart check out his stuff Tom Nathy says we need to see this alleged Preston <laughs> I guess I, he's, he's, he's really kind of shy I don't think I've met he's, Preston actually I'm not sure you have either no I don't meet people in this business <laughs> I I have not met Nancy Atkinson, which is just a total shame. That's the shame. funniest part. Isn't that the yeah, yeah yeah? Nancy Atkinson, my senior editor, has been you know really helping with the universe today for years and years and years, and I haven't even met her. You video uh, conferenced. Oh yeah, no, no, we we know each other virtually, but she like stayed at your house one time for. Yeah, for yeah, she stayed at my house right? a couple of times, but yeah. but she only lives a couple hours away from me, yeah. and she's like come to see me give talks at the. Schools her kids went to. Uh, Tatiana Vaslevska asked, yes. uh, "What was the asteroid made of?" We answered that. Um, Nancy Graziano says, "Rolling on the floor, laughing my ass off." Now Nancy <laughs> is the um, administrator, moderator. moderator for the Astronomy Facebook Cast page. page on Facebook. And so she's the one who approves you or disproves you from joining the group. So Nancy, thank you so much. Yes. Nancy, and she wars so on spammers. Yes. We really appreciate all your help. Um, it's Yes. Thank you so much. Josh Andrews says, the obvious way forward is to relabel all asteroids as either terrorists or immigrants. <laughs> Terrorists. Maybe. Can you please tweet that so I can retweet it? No, I will not. But I will put it into your. Thank you. That's that's pretty. Do you want, you want to throw that in the chat here for you? Yes. Yes. All right. That's brilliant. That isn't that brilliant. <laughs> um. All right. Done. Can you uh, t put it in the name of the person so I can attribute? Don't. Josh Andrews. Thank you. I think. What's your Josh? Why don't you put which, what's your Twitter handle, and then we can retweet it. I think it was Josh Andrews. It's already my mind is lost all this stuff. Uh, Lee Mitchell asks. And this was sort of back to the previous one. That if the Earth were to capture an asteroid as a second moon, how big would it have to be before it would have a noticeable effect on the tides? Uh, that would depend on how distant its orbit was. Smaller things close to the Earth can have the exact same effect as bigger things further away. Right, but close, inside the Roche limit, going to crash into the planet. So, so bad. But well, inside the Roche limit, it's going to get torn apart by tidal yeah. forces. But I mean, the thing is that these asteroids are going to be the, the mass of a mountain. Like, if they're big, they're going to be the mass of a mountain, right? And... You know, the tidal effects of a big mountain on the other side of the Earth is not that big. So, um, Tom Nathy says, got to see a 1,000 piece of the Chelyabinsk meteorite. Fusion crust, chondrules, heavy. <laughs> heavy. But 1,000 bucks, so there you go. That's a sort of idea. Okay, here you go. It's Josh Ertree is his Twitter handle. 
Let me just throw that into the chat. Thank, Thank you, you, Josh. Um, I put that up there. Moving on. Uh, Eric Wells says, "Have any meteorites been brought back from the moon?" Uh, I have no idea. So yes. Well, we call, okay, but hold on. Let's let's try and unpack what he's saying. So, so have any rocks been returned from the moon? Obviously, in the yes, Apollo missions, they brought but back have any of those rocks had a non have had their origin somewhere other than in the event that caused the formation of the moon? Right. So, did a person? I don't know. Yeah. Did did any of the Apollo astronauts pick up a meteorite? Because I know that uh, Opportunity or Spirit discovered a meteorite on the surface of Mars, right? Yes. It's, I think it's happened more than once, but but like a clearly ob an object of non-Martian origin sitting there on the surface of Mars. So, But did an astronaut find anything and bring it back? I don't know. I'm going to guess not, because that would have been pretty amazing. Although, they're all, I'm sure they are all over the place on the moon, right? Because they're going to look very different from the surface of the moon, and they will be they will not get worn down by the atmosphere or the water or any of that. So great question. Um, so Cecil Morgan asked in the last segment, you said that the planet's orbits would be unaffected by the sun's collapse because the mass wouldn't change. But wouldn't the ejected material from the sun's collapse be dense enough to drag the planets into an inward spiral? So, okay, so let's imagine, right, we've got the, the sun, it puffs out as a red giant, um, and then it's like puffing out this envelope of material, and the planets are going to be plowing through that envelope, right, a bit. It's not going to be like right in the atmosphere of the sun, but there is going to be a certain amount of material they're going to be going through. That's going to act like a break. Will that make them spiral inward? Don't know. Okay, so... so <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's it's an issue if we have combined forces at play. You have stuff hitting the planets, changing their masses, small factor. You have frictional drag, medium-sized factor. You have mass loss. Right. And how does the drag created by plowing through it counterbalance with the amount of mass that's being lost? People who've worked to model things like this have it currently working out that the Earth doesn't end up inside the Sun. Right. And so, as you say, there's too many forces. You've got the lo the lost mass, so the planets are going to be moving further away. They're going to be plowing through some of this material, so they're going to be, there is going to be a bit of friction. We don't know. We This is not your specialty. Well, okay. it, it's not just that, but it's it's the type of thing where there's, we're still learning about mass loss rates. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some ideas that we might not even have a um, planetary nebula when the sun dies. Right. So, um, okay, so let's go back around to this question. So Lee Mitchell asked this earlier. If you could have any astronomer from history in a virtual star party, who would you choose? So I already I said, totally, yeah, I, I would I, I love, love to talk to Galileo. Yeah, I think that would turn into a total Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, especially given the people that we have on the star party. So, yeah, and if we could have two, because there's two of us and we're both being asked the question, um, I think having Galileo and Herschel, and if we can add a third person in, William Herschel and Carolyn Herschel both, because Carolyn Herschel was apparently a very tough-as-nails lady, and, and I would just love to have that kind of a music conductor in there with the trying to organize the chaos and then the snipey soprano soloist <laughs> who's a hard ass <laughs> also in there with her knowledge and yeah. and I just yeah that would But I just I love this idea. I mean these poor people who who didn't discover have the so much but they didn't have the technology, and so they could they could find this stuff, but they had no idea it what it is that they were. Black they were and white, looking. faint fuzzies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were just looking with their, in many cases with their eyes, you know, ears on Saturn, like just not knowing. Yeah. And to be able to sit down and kind of go, hey, let's look, let's let's look at it with better technology. That would be that would be amazing. Yeah. So that's a that's a great question. I love that question. Um, 
Chris Kennedy uh, Chris Kennedy says, any idea where the dinosaur killing asteroid came from within our solar system? So the 65 million years ago, the, um, right. the one that hit Chicxulub, what do you think? Yeah. Where did it come from? Um, Was it an Apollo? That's what I'm looking up. Yeah. Chris Kennedy is one of the astronomers from the Virtual Star Party, and uh, it lives in uh, the UK. Man, this is great. This is just like a who's who of all our friends. Um, and there's Richard Drum. No idea? Still looking? Still okay. looking. Okay. Yeah, okay, I don't me, know. Let me dig some other ones up here. Um, yeah, I'm not... I'm not seeing information on that. I, I suspect that since we don't really have any fragments from it, we can't answer that question. Uh, Nancy Graziano says, I would think that the fate of the solar system would also be in question due to our merging with Andromeda. Probably no, not, not, right? not so much. Yeah, yeah no. It's, it's two ships passing in the night in the giant ocean. So when that happens, the only stuff is going to be the dust piling up and forming new stars, but the rest of it will be fine. <laughs> Thomas Tranaker says, my work is done. Good night. In that I had to change my calendar over. So thank you, Thomas. You just don't forget, in a month, this is your job now. I will just leave it. But now you realize all of us. It, it's like waiting to hear you say globular and about. There's about certain things. Globular. Yeah. Um, uh, Chin Chang Wu says uh, there will be a website like Kickstarter for scientists where the public can back their projects. Experiment. That's what I heard. Yeah. 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 Experiment. So that's a it, tough one, right? Because so, so one of the problems is, is I actually looked very hard into putting a project up on that site when it was called Mycorrhiza. It's a great company. The two, two people who got it started are very easy and friendly to work with. But one of the things that you run into is they're trying to fund science projects through gifts and donations. And universities, when, when I write a grant to the federal government, for every $100,000 I get for my research, I have to get another $43,000 to give to my university to pay for the buildings, pay for the infrastructure, pay for the accountants, pay for all of those things. And that's called overhead. When you give to Astronomy Cast, when you give to CosmoQuest, 100% of that money goes directly to paying for my projects. There, there's no overhead that goes to the institution. So this falls into a gray area of it's a gift, but it's being allocated to do research. And Mycorrhiza, now called Experiment, um, doesn't allow you to ask for the overhead funding. Right. Well, and if that's necessary, they will. And and so, I I know my university said no, you can't use it. Oh. So, yeah. Well, I mean, if if I mean, I think the problem with with experiment is that there, you've really got to just like be willing to donate your money to a scientific cause, and and there's no. It's not like you, in the end, get a new bike lock or a ooh yeah. You it's you are just pushing that progress forward, and so the the whole process of demonstrating whether the experiment worked and the research papers coming out of it and stuff that's 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 going to be tough. But I think it's totally worth doing, and I'll bet yes. you there will be some really interesting scientific studies that get that get pushed forward. And so. and honestly. Once the first research project that costs more than a few thousand dollars is funded, once the first research project that's a few hundred thousand dollars is funded, universities are going to start rethinking. Mm -hmm. um, but it is one of those things that a university does have to sit and think very hard because especially the research that I do, it falls into two categories, research that involves lots of computer infrastructure, research that, that involves lots of students, and we're mapping out the surfaces of worlds, we're finding overlapping galaxies, and then my personal research into variable stars, although that keeps getting sidelined. Um, but then I also do a lot of human subject research where I'm uh, trying to understand working with education researchers and psychologists, how do people learn, what are the connections between people that, that cause them to listen to podcasts, 
Um, research with human subjects requires monitoring. Otherwise, researchers will go off the deep end and do crazy shit. And shady, um, ethical, uh, yeah, moral, and, yeah. And so I can understand why a, res why a university wants to get a certain percentage of the income to go to pay for all of that monitoring that's happening. And it's, it's I don't know what the answer is. Uh, Tatiana Valisevska, Valisevska, Vasilevska. This is your world. I can't see this stuff. Okay, Tatiana. I'm sorry, Tatiana. I'm gonna no. I'm gonna try. Here we go. Vasilevska. Vasilevska. Um, what puzzles me is why the asteroid was not detected. Don't we have enough technology for that? It came out of nowhere, this, right? It came out well, of the, the sun. Well, the sky came... is an awful big place, and yeah, it came out of the direction of the sun. It came out of the east in the morning. Um, and, and so you run into two problems. One is the sky is an awful big place, and so we have lots of surveys going on, but the surveys aren't looking towards the sun because it's towards the sun and you can't see anything but sky and sun when you look towards the sun. Um, there's radar, but radar is extremely uh, expensive. You can only look at a narrow beam of the sky, only detect things that are fairly close or very big. Pick one. Um, so we focus the majority of our monitoring efforts on the band of the sky where you see the zodiac, the ecliptic in the sky. This is where the planets are. This is where the bulk of the asteroids are. And we're going to miss stuff. And we're going to get surprised by stuff. And this was one of those surprises. This is why we need surveys to systematically monitor the entirety of the sky. The Large Synoptic Survey Telescope is going to be the first one to map out, um, well, in, in its case, all the sky that's visible from its location in Chile. I think it's every four days, and it will do this for multiple years. So that will nail one large fraction of the sky, including the entirety of the zodiac. Um, ecliptic, different word. Yeah. Um, but well, I know that the Sentinel mission wants to be in like a trailing sun, Earth trailing or Earth yeah. forward. So look at it, essentially look at the the Earth from far enough away that you're seeing the stuff that Earth can't see because it's coming right. down the ecliptic. So that's you know that's a good way to go about it. Um, Ranko Prozo says, aren't these events more common, but we don't see them because they explode over the oceans. Yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah, so there are probably impacts that we're just not seeing. Amazing meteorites, fireballs. Beyond a certain point, I think well, they no, no, no. We do them, have right? statistics. We do have statistics on this from weather satellites and other Earth imaging satellites. They, there are a certain number of flashes every year. I don't remember the exact number, but it's order of tens of events each year uh, that are getting detected. Flashes. Okay. Um, in terms of these big impacts. Uh, the shock waves in the atmosphere get detected by this, that, and the other thing. So this probably was the first one that has occurred since we had massive monitoring equipment all across the globe. Right. Okay, well, I think we probably want to... There, was there anything on, happening on the Twitter? Is anything happening on the... On the anywhere the, else? The awesome quote, the, the obvious way forward is to relabel all the asteroids, either terrorists or immigrants, so that we can get money to search for them, um, is getting happily retweeted. And that pleases Perfect. me because it's a quote that is true and it makes me laugh. Yep. Um, Hugo Burnham uh, agrees that Carolyn Herschel would be great to have in the uh, virtual star party. Um, and Hugo Burnham also notes that Preston debuted in Astronomy Cast. 28. Oh, that's true. Wow. Yeah. Um, Guido Bivra says that meteoroids will henceforth be referred to as Binsks around here. <laughs> um, Hugo Burnham noticed our, our plug for Phil Plate's excellent book, Death from the Skies. Yes. Yes. Read Phil Plate's Death from the Skies. Yes. Uh, Richard Drum says you'll have to come to Dragon Con and get your Binsk. So I will come to Dragon Con this year. Yay! Yay! Um, uh, I will be at Pensacon in Pensacola in a couple of weeks and at the Science Online Conference the week after that. So if you're going to be at any of those things, drop me a note. We'll see each other. It will be awesome. I'll have a booth. We'll be selling stuff. 
All right. So on this note, um, let's uh, let's wrap this up. So once again, Pamela, thank you very much for doing this double bill. So glad that your voice has returned from its uh, from the flu and that you're yeah. feeling a lot better. Uh, please try not to infect anyone else. I, I I can only apologize to at tiny intern for giving her my flu. Yes. But yes. All right, and I will see you uh, when I see you next. Uh, the next thing that's going to be happening, well, it's a couple of things. <laughs> you guys are going to love this. I am the guest tonight on Billy Wilson's show <laughs> at 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock, so three more hours of this. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I won't be sort of on. I will just hang out. Maybe I'll just nap. I think while we do the show. So, so there's that. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, have you already? You, I think you're going to be on the show with him as well at some point. I saw. Yeah, you in, in a couple of weeks. Um, yeah, I just thought I would just. Yeah. Just add it all together. His his show is just fun, and his cat is is fascinating. Yeah, and he he has you know live musicians that come and yeah. stuff. So no, it's it's a real. He's trip, really so. figured it out. Yeah. So uh, Billy Wilson, uh, check out his. Uh, you can just do a search for it. And yeah, I'll be there tonight, from seven till I don't know till I fall, pass out. Um, <laughs> and uh, so there's that tonight. Uh, then we're going to be doing the virtual star party on Sunday night. So that's going to happen. And, Noisy uh, astronomer will be there. Yeah. Which will be great. People have been people have been chanting for Noisy's return. So if she can if we can get her back, that'll be fantastic. So cool. Okay. Well, thanks again, Pamela. Thanks everyone for watching. We really appreciate it, and we will see you all not Monday, but the week after that. All right. <laughs>